This is the Elon Musk Podcast, your daily hit of what is really going on at Tesla, SpaceX, XAI, and the rest of the Musk universe. I'm your host, Will Walden, and I have covered Elon Musk for more than five years, spent a year on the ground at SpaceX Starbase during early Starship development, and before this, I spent my career as a software developer, working with billion-dollar companies. I've also built and sold my own businesses. And now I make content and help other people grow their companies. And on this show, I use that experience to break down the news, filter out all the noise, and give you clear context you can actually use. Something happened the other day when I was on Reddit. We started a discussion around SpaceX sending people on a starship from Earth into space. Now, let's back up a little bit here. SpaceX is in their 11th test flight. The next test flight will be their Block 3 Starship, which is more powerful and bigger than their Block 2 flights. Now, Block 2 has had some incidents. A few of the flights have, well, let's just say blown up, had a rud mid-flight. And the problem with that is that when that happens, it is not a good thing if people are aboard, right? So we're going to be talking today about how people will be flying inside of a starship and what it actually takes, the regulatory landscape that surrounds it. It is wild what people can do with spaceflight now because it's not all determined by NASA anymore or by a government body other than, let's just say, the FAA, and maybe there's going to be another government body in the future that's going to be taking part of this. But right now, it's just the FAA that works on this stuff. This is actually one of the most fascinating regulatory gaps in the entire space industry. And understanding it requires us to explore how human spaceflight certification evolved from about 60 years ago and why we're entering truly uncharted territory with Starship. Now, let me take you through the landscape of how human spacecraft have been certified historically, because what you're identifying um, with this problem is a profound challenge that the industry hasn't really solved quite yet. Thanks to our amazing community members like you, we've reached the top 15 of Spotify's video podcasts, the top 10 audio podcasts on both Apple and Spotify for the tech category. So you all make this possible. If you want to support us more, Check out our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash stage zero news so we can keep this free and open for you to enjoy. Something interesting happened the other day. I was looking through our stats on Spotify and Apple podcasts, and I noticed that about 55% of you are not subscribed to the show. That means 45% of you are subscribed, and I really do appreciate your support. Now, the other 55% of you are awesome but I'm going to ask you for a favor. Could you please hit the subscribe button? It'll take you one second. I'm going to promise you 10 years of this podcast for free. No paywalls. I'm not going to charge you anything ever, but I'm going to give you 10 years of this show for free. I've already been doing it for five years and I plan on doing it for 10 more. And the only way that we can continue doing this is with your support. So one second of your time to hit the subscribe button right now would help this show tremendously. Thank you so much. Now, for the first 60 years of human spaceflight, the concept of human rating existed entirely within government agencies. NASA developed its human rating standards through hard-learned lessons from Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. And the Soviets had their own internal processes, though less formally documented. The Chinese space program follows similar government internal certification. And in every case, the same organization that operated the spacecraft also certified its safety. Now, this created a particular dynamic. The certifying agency had skin in the game. When NASA certified that the space shuttle was safe for astronauts, NASA leadership was putting their own people at risk. The engineers who signed off on Crew Dragon safety knew that their colleagues, sometimes their friends, would be riding in it. This personal investment created a certain rigor, though as Challenger and Columbia showed us, it wasn't foolproof. Now, the commercial crew program marked the first time that NASA certified vehicles it didn't own or operate. 
But even this wasn't truly independent certification. SpaceX and Boeing were contractors working to NASA specifications and requirements when NASA deeply embedded in the design process from day one. NASA engineers had visibly um, looked into every design decision, every test result, every anomaly investigation, and the companies couldn't just show up with a finished spacecraft and ask for certification. NASA was involved throughout the entire development process, making it more of a joint effort than independent verification. Now, here's where things get really interesting. The Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, which regulates commercial aviation with incredible strictness, takes a fundamentally different approach to commercial human spaceflight. Under current law, extended through January of 2028, the FAA is explicitly prohibited from creating safety regulations for spacecraft occupants. They can regulate launches to protect the public on the ground. They can protect airspace, but they cannot tell SpaceX or Blue Origin or anybody else how to keep passengers safe. This learning period or moratorium reflects a deliberate policy change by Congress. The thinking went like this. The commercial space industry is too young and evolving too rapidly for prescriptive safety regulations. If the FAA stepped in with requirements based on 1960s capsule designs, they might inadvertently prevent innovations that can make spaceflight safer and better and faster. Better to let the industry experiment and learn with passengers accepting the risks through informed consent. Now think about what this means in practice, though. When Blue Origin flies paying customers on New Shepard, there's no government certification that the vehicle is safe. Instead, passengers just sign a waiver acknowledging they understand the risks. The FAA verifies that Blue Origin has insurance, that they won't drop debris on populated areas, and that they've informed passengers about these risks. But not that the vehicle meets any strict particular safety standards for the people inside. Virgin Galactic operates under the same framework. Despite carrying paying customers to space, no government entity has human-rated Spaceship 2 in the way NASA human rates vehicles. The company developed its own internal safety standards, conducted its own test program, and made its own determination that the vehicle was ready for passengers. The FAA licensed the flights, but didn't certify the safety of the occupants. Now, the informed consent model works for tourism and private flights, but it has crucial limitations. NASA won't accept it for their astronauts. They require full human rating certification for their standards. No other government agency has shown willingness to put their personnel on vehicles certified only through informed consent. And insurance companies, while willing to cover some risk, haven't yet figured out how to price policies for regular commercial human spaceflight operations. Now, the model also assumes passengers can meaningfully consent to risks that might not be fully understood. And when you board a commercial airline, decades of operational data inform the safety statistics. When you board Starship, how do you evaluate the risk of the belly flop maneuver when it's never been done with humans on board? How do you price the risk of 18,000 heat shield tiles when we don't have statistical models for their failure rates? Looking internationally doesn't provide much additional precedent either. Uh, Russia has sold seats on Soyuz for decades, but these flew under the Russian space agency's government certification. Tourists were essentially along for the ride in government missions. China hasn't opened the program to commercial participation yet. The ESA European Space Agency has never developed independent human spaceflight capabilities. And the closest international parallel might be how maritime classification societies like Lloyd's Register or DNV evolved to certify ship safety independently of government agencies. These organizations developed from insurance industry needs. Insurers wanted independent verification that SIPs were seaworthy. Over centuries, though, their standards became so respected that governments often simply require classification, society approval, rather than conducting their own inspections. Now, this maritime model points toward one possible future for spaceflight certification. We're seeing early movements in this direction. The Commercial Space Flight Federation, an industry group, has developed some voluntary standards. 
ASTM International, which creates consensus standards for everything from steel to toys, has a committee on commercial space flight. But these are still voluntary guidelines, not certification programs with real teeth and grit. What would give such standards that grit and teeth? Insurance requirements might drive adoption. If insurers demanded independent certification before covering flights, operators would have to comply. Large corporate customers might require certification before putting their employees on spacecraft. And eventually, after the FAA moratorium expires, regulations might reference industry standards rather than creating government requirements from scratch. Now, this brings us back to Starship. For NASA missions, SpaceX must meet NASA's human rating requirements. But for private missions, SpaceX faces a genuine certification vacuum. The FAA can't certify occupant safety until at least 2028, and even then, they'll likely take years to develop regulations. No independent body exists with the credibility and expertise to certify something as complex as Starship. SpaceX could self-certify, uh, essentially saying, we've done our homework and believe this is safe. That's legally sufficient for private flights under current regulations, but would customers accept it? Some would. Now, would Jared Isaacman climb aboard a Starship based solely on SpaceX's internal assessment? Probably. And the cancellation of Dear Moon suggests at least some customers want more assurance than SpaceX can currently provide. Now, the company could pursue voluntary oversight, perhaps inviting independent experts to review their safety processes, similar to how some crypto exchanges undergo voluntary audits to build customer confidence. They could publish their safety analysis and test data for peer review. They could adopt standards from aviation or other industries where applicable. But none of this would constitute true independent certification of the kind government agencies have traditionally provided. Now, perhaps the most likely near-term development involves the insurance industry stepping in as de facto certifiers. If SpaceX wants to carry passengers, they'll need liability insurance. Insurers, before writing policies, will demand extensive technical reviews, test data, and possibly design modifications. The requirements might become the de facto safety standard for commercial human spaceflight. And this insurance-driven model has precedent. In early aviation, insurance requirements often drove safety improvements faster than government regulations. Insurers had direct financial incentive to reduce accidents, leading them to demand pilot training standards, maintenance procedures, and design improvements that later became regulatory requirements. And for Starship specifically, insurers might demand demonstrated reliability through hundreds of cargo flights independent review of critical systems, additional redundancy in certain areas, or even design changes like adding abort capabilities for human flights. The premiums they charge would reflect their assessment of risk, creating market signals about safety that might be more responsive than government regulations. Now, what we're witnessing with Starship is the space industry grappling with a fundamental transition from government-dominated to commercially-driven human spaceflight. The regulatory and certification frameworks haven't caught up with the technology. There's no established independent board with the expertise, authority, and credibility to certify something as revolutionary as Starship for human flight. And this gap creates both opportunity and risk. It allows SpaceX to innovate without regulatory constraints that might prevent breakthrough approaches. But it also means passengers on early flights will be pioneers in the truest sense test dummies, accepting risks that aren't fully quantified or independently verified. The industry will likely evolve toward more formal certification processes, but Starship might fly humans before those processes exist, making its early crew participants in a grand experiment in commercial space governance. Now, the precedent that Starship sets, whether through successful flights or tragically through failures will likely shape how this whole industry approaches human certification for decades to come. And in that sense, SpaceX isn't just developing a new vehicle. They're pioneering an entirely new model for determining when a spacecraft is safe enough for humans. The fact that no clear precedent exists outside government agencies isn't just a regular curiosity anymore. It's a fundamental challenge that can determine whether a commercial human spaceflight beyond tourism becomes viable. 
Hey, thank you so much for listening today. I really do appreciate your support. If you could take a second and hit this subscribe or the follow button on whatever podcast platform that you're listening on right now, I'd greatly appreciate it. It helps out the show tremendously and you'll never miss an episode. And each episode is about 10 minutes or less to get you caught up quickly. And please, if you want to support the show even more, go to patreon.com slash stage zero. And please take care of yourselves and each other. And I'll see you tomorrow.